Happy birthday! Hello, welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm Scott Orr. Thank you so much for listening. And today is an incredibly exciting episode. Um, I mean, that sounds a bit uh, that sounds a bit vain, but it's exciting because it's our one year birthday. It's our first birthday, one year anniversary, however you want to call it. The podcast launched on March sixth, uh, two thousand. I was going to say nineteen, two thousand and eighteen. And here we are on March 5th, launching this one-year anniversary, so a day short. Um, And we've done, this is our 21st interview, 21st record label, and we've done three bonus episodes. So um, thank you so much for listening. The downloads have, I think we've hit, I haven't added it up in 2019 yet, but I think we're over 13,000. We are, we're over 13,000 downloads for one year, and we've had the opportunity to talk with some incredible labels and to be frank there's some really big and exciting labels that we pre-recorded that haven't even released yet um but the opportunity to talk with with people like um sub pop and and captured tracks and hardly art and yep rock and father daughter and i mean honestly it goes on but not just that not just these these names that are recognizable and maybe have um, large uh, hit records, um, but also there's these labels that have had a huge impact on me over this past year. And there are these things that people say in these interviews that just stick with me, and and they stick with me forever. And when I um, and when I'm working on my own label and doing things uh, in the music industry. These little tidbits that everyone has said over these past 21 episodes, they come back and they remind me to press on or not to get discouraged um, or to try something new um, or to commit to something or to double down on something and, um, or to share something. And so this has been a huge, uh, hugely impactful year for me learning from these people. And these people have been so modest and they've been so generous with their information and uh, I've been so grateful to all 20 of the interviewees plus the bonus episodes of the industry insiders uh, all 23 people who have who have shared their wisdom and their experiences and have been honest and vulnerable with um, with our audience it's been incredible and I hope that you've got something from it too over the past year I've I've had some Um, really kind uh, Instagram messages and emails and tweets um, about the podcast. And that's been great. And you can always continue to do that because that really helps. Anyway, I want to thank you all for listening. Um, Usually each episode exceeds the previous episode downloads. Um, And like I said, we've hit 13,000 downloads this year, which has just been incredible. And there's no stopping. I mean, the episodes are pre-recorded right into the summer. Um, and uh, it's it's great, and there's some some really great labels that have been recommended to me that I haven't even got a chance to record yet. And there's some there to be honest, there's labels out there that I just haven't had the the chance to to contact. There's just been so much content um, that's already, and and it's it's really exciting. Today's label is um, other songs, my label. And, uh, you know, I, I, that, that, that may be vain and, and, uh, sorry, I'm just going to adjust my mic stand here. It's drooping a little bit. Um, that, you know, uh, listening back over it, I feel bad <laughs> that I spent so much time talking about our label, but listen, here's why I did it. It was a, a, a three reasons. Number one, it's the one year anniversary of the podcast. So why not? Uh, number two, it's uh, free content. You know, I don't have to spend a day uh, emailing people trying to schedule a podcast. Um, and uh, and the third reason is, um, I can't remember. I thought I had three reasons. Who cares? Today, my friend Ben Robinson, who is an interview extraordinaire, I really, uh, he was one of the first uh, people I've ever met that um, was so good at interviewing. Uh, and I was interviewed by him for a radio show he did years and years ago, and before I even was friends with him. And I was like blown away with how great this guy was at, at interviewing. Um, and he's also a fantastic poet. He is my favorite poet. 
and uh, and his name is Ben Robinson. You should look him up. Just just Google Ben Robinson poetry. Something will come up. Anyway, he was generous enough to come up here to the attic and sit with me and and ask me questions so that we could talk about other songs and and celebrate the our our birthday. Keep an eye on the numbers for me there too, just in case okay. we're we crash. I haven't had a crash in a long time. But you did lose that one. Yeah, with Mac DeMarco or Mike Sniper. Jeez. Yeah, and, and actually in tw- in 23 episodes, or however many, yeah, 23 episodes, 24 episodes, um, if there was one window to miss, <laughs> it was the Mac DeMarco. <laughs> to not miss, it was the Mac DeMarco. The big like, behind the scenes reveal. Yeah, it was... It sucked so bad, and and then like all summer long, I was emailing Mike Sniper and saying, "Can we try to?" Because he was really kind. He was like, "Don't worry, let's call back and yeah. we'll redo that section." And it was like, it was this the way I planned the interview is to save the conversation about Mac DeMarco for the very end, because you know, Mac's like one of the bigger indie artists in the world, and f- like, how did that label find him? Yeah, discover him. And, and grow him into what he is was such a cool insight, especially for our fans, our likely Mac DeMarco fans. Totally, totally. And it was a really cool story. And then Jeez. to look back and go, wow, I, I <laughs> missed it all. <laughs> it's just for you. So now that rarely happens anymore, um, the the crashing. Uh, there's been occasionally like I get a lot of Wi-Fi problems. Where okay, just like interference. Interference, Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks for doing this. So this is a, a very special episode because we are, um, the podcast, it hits its one year anniversary on March 5th and which is when this will be out. Cool. And, uh, it's, um, yeah, one year. And I thought it would be and there has been some com- questions about our label, other songs. And so I thought it'd be a good one year to kind of bring you Ben Robinson in and just to chat about the label because you have a history with the label and to chat about the pod and to chat about um you know just this whole marriage between the two um and just kind of a special anniversary episode but still a a regular episode so thanks for doing it because otherwise i'd be interviewing myself (laughs) (laughs) which would be basically what happens in the shower or on a long drive i usually interview myself glad to be your (laughs) stand-up yeah (laughs) Well, and it's a big anniversary for you guys this year too, isn't it? Are you guys 10 years this year? Uh, other songs are 10 years next year, 2010, okay. 2020. So we're getting there. Yeah. It was summer of 2010. I actually go by the, um, the, the best way to go by is like when I registered the domain, <laughs> which was April 2010. The birth. Yeah. The birth. So I, yeah, 10 years next year. And, um, I, I've talked to a lot of labels in this process and, and a lot of labels I've talked to have entered in their 10 year or 20 year or five year, but a quite a few on their 10 year. And I've asked them, what are you doing on your 10 year? And hmm. I would say the majority of them have said nothing, <laughs> like maybe a few special uh, reissues, yeah. but I, I don't think that people in indie music like to pat themselves on the back too hmm. much or like to, you know, throw a big party. And I, and I, I, it's probably you know, because like we're a modest group of artists. (laughs) And the other thing is like, it's almost like bad luck or Mm. like, I would say in a way it's like, I would say there's not much to celebrate because we're not where I'd wanted to be in 10 years or where I still think we could be or interesting. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't, I don't really want to stop and celebrate because we haven't had a hit record. We haven't had a, you know, what I thought we would have had in 10 years. And so it's like, let's keep working and let's see where we're at in 25 years or 50 mm. years. And then maybe we'll celebrate. Uh, you know what I mean? Do you think other people, like, do you think you're alone in feeling that way about the label though? About my label? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think that other people look at other songs and are like, really expect <laughs> them to be a lot further than they were. Yeah, no, it's true. You're right. Um, uh yeah, no, that's that's obviously true. I think I would be more hard on the label than yeah. anybody else. And and you know, I was talking about this type of thing with with my buddy the other day about how we always move the goalposts when it comes to our own measure of success. Mm. And and so yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I would be um 
I would be very hard on the label and on on my su- success as an artist. But when you look back and go, oh, like we've made more money year over year, we've grown our fan base. If we, you know, we get emails from people saying we appreciate the podcast or the studio tours or the totally the records. Um, somebody told me yesterday that like they were talking with someone who said, oh yeah, like I, I, in, when I was in college, like a long time ago, all I listened to was other song stuff. Hmm. Somebody told another friend about that. And, and it's like, wow, we're that old that like people are nostalgic to some of our records. Hmm. Like, so that, so y- the more you look at it, it, but as like a, an owner and a entrepreneur and an artist, you never do that. You never give yourself a pat on the back. You never totally. give yourself the credit you deserve. You know, you're always critical. Interesting. What did you have? Like you said that you don't feel like you've met the goal. Did you guys have, did you have a goal starting out? Well, and see, that's the other thing is, um, I def, I had the actual goal was to just do it for fun. And <laughs> I, I would have said all along that we were just doing it for fun and we had no goal. We had no aspirations to be a big label. In fact, I, to this day, I regret not having, not having, not having had bigger aspirations hmm. from the beginning because there's these labels I look at who are hitting their 10 year, the same amount of me, and they've broken huge artists, like yeah. huge artists. And they are iconic in the indie music scene and which I don't think I am at all. And so that uh, now I think, well, that's because when I got started with with my buddy Jeff and Eric and Evan and and we were talking about this thing, it was all just a joke for us. It was mm. just a way to to have fun. We thought of it as a local thing, not a global thing or even a national thing. And looking back, so so no, in a way, like now I'm I'm tougher on myself, but back then. There, we didn't really have any goals. So we certainly have exceeded whatever goals we hmm. thought we'd have. Um, and I do, looking back, I, I regret that I actually didn't say, hey, let's let's break an artist or let's, um, you know, let's make this sales thing or let's try to get a Juno in 10 years, you know? Um, yeah, we never had any of those goals. And I regret that. I regret that, it, that it, we were just being silly about it until six... Or seven years in. And then we're like, wait a second. This could actually be Maybe this is a real thing. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. You said it starts out with you and Jeff and Eric. Yeah. Talk about that. How does, where does it all begin? The name Other Songs came from, uh, Other Songs Music Co. is a fake album or a uh, label name that I put on my first few independent releases. Okay. Because in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, I had independent EPs and albums under my own name, Scott Orr. And I, putting a label logo on the back of your CD just totally. felt like the thing to do. I mean, why wouldn't you, you know? Nobody knows. On one hand, it was like me just imitating my heroes. And on the other hand, it was like, well, if I trick somebody out there that I'm a legit artist, then, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and releasing a DIY CD back in the early 2000s wasn't very common. No. So, and it wasn't like you definitely had to be a part of a label. So putting this Mm. fake label name on there for a long time was just for fun. And then I, in between my own releases, I had started recording with my friend, Evan and Eric Fuslay, who um, were in a band called Piro. And and in, this was in 2008, 2009. And I, I knew that they had a bit, a big of a bit of a following because they were in college at the time. And And I just thought now's the time to start a record label because we're sharing my knowledge of where to get CDs printed and how Mm. to record and master. They're sharing their knowledge of live music and venues and, and their fan base. I have a small online fan base. They have a small fan base. Let's combine them. So when that, I mean, I sat in my basement in 2009 and said, can we do this? And they said, yeah, absolutely. And so Evan and I were kind of pushing that forward Hmm in 2000 in 2010 that's when we in the spring of 2010 we bought the domain i said to them if we're going to do this label like can we use the the name i already had yeah and it wasn't because i was attached to it in any way it was just it was easier and it made more it it validated those (laughs) previous (laughs) releases yeah so that was the 
yeah, so there was like now all of a sudden the label's been around since 2005, in or at least the name has. Skip the first five Skip years. Skip the first five years, yeah. So, um, and then so they were cool with that, and and that was it. It was just like let's just make stickers, let's just put the logo on the back of the CDs that we do. But then it became this big push to um, find as many bands as possible hmm. to to join the fray because it was like that's to me what a real label was, was a label had a huge roster and it had a compilation CD. So we did, we like um, in the band Piro, Jeff Winans, who yeah. ended up working with me on the label for a good long time. And he was in the band Piro. He brought his band Brookie and, and it just, everybody knew somebody. And then we found the Good Hunters and I can't remember how that even happened. We played a show with the Good Hunters. Piro played a show with the Good Hunters. We brought the Good Hunters in. And it was just like, who else you got? Who yeah. else is out there? My friend, Ben Fretz, who is Benjamin, and I had been making music together since high school. He just got a new brother-in-law, James Hoffman, <laughs> who was a songwriter. And he brought in James Hoffman. And then Ben became an artist himself. So it was really just like, who in your first like 20 contacts play like a guitar? Pick up hockey team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's true. It, it, when we were playing indoor soccer, it was the same way. It was like, do you have running shoes? Do you have cleats? Yeah. Can you come out? Yeah. You're on the label. That And that was it. That and And there was really no stopping. If you were in a friend circle and you were a half decent songwriter, then you had to be on the label because yeah. it, it just added more validity to it hmm. to the point where we had to hit the brakes because we're re releasing stuff too quickly. It was quantity over quality. Yeah. And, and it was like, had we had saved like those 12 releases in the first year <laughs> and spread them out over the next three years, yeah. we would have been a little bit more sustainable. Um, and we wouldn't have completely burned out. Like I felt like I completely burned out at that end of the first year, 2011, hmm. the, the first full year. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how it, it came together. Interesting. Well, it's funny you say that you burned out because I feel like I was looking back at the catalog just sort of to, to jog my memory mm -hmm. about what came out in that first year. And you're right. There's like a dozen releases that first year. Yeah. And then there's almost nothing for like exactly. a year or two. Yeah. And I, the second year, uh, like the second full year, 2012, um, had, uh, I believe it was the first Matt Paxton single in yep. a second. And then it had JP Haney, The Sand, which mm -hmm. is my, which is a, an artist I discovered on Bandcamp from Salt Lake City. And that record has gone on to be my favorite, one of my favorite albums of all time, and, the, and okay. my top 10 albums of all time. And uh, like the proudest release. And, mm. and, and to this day, it's harder to find independent artists that aren't already scooped up, but to find, if I were able to find an artist like that again on Bandcamp, I would, I, I would die. But that record. And then the, the, um, the Tim and the Brave yeah. solo debut EP, which went on to be, um, iTunes Canada's best, yeah. uh, best of list in, in 2012. And, and it is to this day gets tons of plays and is a great EP. Wow. So, that did you, you played on that EP or not that you, one the next one. Oh, the next one yeah were you around for that record i was around but i don't think i was i probably wasn't doing other yeah. song stuff at that point. i think it was just gareth maybe and and i'm um, <laughs> just gareth and glenn and that was the, the first time i ever met glenn was okay he dropped by the house to play drums on that record wild and i'd never met him before and he played on my old broken drum kit <laughs> <laughs> he played the last song on the record anyway um but yeah, 2012 had just two records. But when I look back, and in in 2011, we had you know the first Brookie EP, and then like two weeks earlier or three weeks later, we had my record, uh, where I lived. Yep. And then like th three weeks or maybe a month after that, we did a Ruby record, and then a month after that, we did the James Hoffman record, and then in in, in the fall, we did like an Eric Brand and the Good Hunters and Allosaurus all in one month. And it was just, it was a shame because there's some records that I feel like didn't get their day in the sun because mm. we had a, a release coming out the next week. And I just didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And I just thought it was about getting as many titles out there. I didn't realize that back then an album only had the week leading up, the week of, and the week after of a life, and then it's gone. I didn't, 
I didn't realize that. And so I didn't really capitalize on that lead up of, you know, mm. a month of celebrating what's to come, doing a big release show. And then a month after of like, you know, milking that release and, and trying to get it heard more. It was, I couldn't do that because two weeks before the album release, I was promoting another record. And then two weeks after the album release, I was promoting another record. So mm. it was too much. And then you you look at 2012 when when you say that like essentially nothing came out. There's two records that are I'm super proud of, and mm. that I in this like down year I'm super proud of, and are you know I think hold up better than than some of our earlier records. Mm. You know, well, and that that sort of seems to be the pace. I mean, I said nothing came out, but. From then on, I feel like you guys have been doing two or three and really focusing on them. Mm -hmm. And that's been a little more of, it shifted towards that model instead. Yeah, and that's like, it's just me. I like to focus on other initiatives like our video stuff and the yeah. pod. And, yep. and I I am a solo artist myself, so I like to focus on my career and furthering that. And, and then, you know, a family and a job and there's all these other totally. things. So I've, I, you know, there's labels that we've had on the show that do like 10 to 15 releases a year. Yeah. There's the average for a label is maybe six to eight releases a year. Mm. Um, and I, I just am astonished at that. I, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to pull that off. I would, I would like to maybe with more hands, but, um, I, yeah. So moving forward my kind of accountability to myself is one major full length where that has that will blow everyone's socks off that's that's been in the works for three years right one major full length and maybe another full length if possible maybe a, an ep fr from a brand new artist or like a catalog artist um and then a couple of singles and then maybe like um, some cool releases like live EPs totally. or acoustic versions of records that have already come out. So that's kind of like in my head, if I look back at 2018, it was like um, we did an M. Greg EP, mm -hmm. Mill Pond Way, which mm -hmm. is a three song, beautiful instrumental folk record. Um, we did a uh, Fanny Price single. Yep. It was her first thing. Um, and then... I think it was probably something else. So I'm I'm blanking on it. And then it was my record was the one that came out in the fall. And so that is a in my mind is a perfect year. We probably should have done another Fanny Price single, but the studio was under construction and we lost that year a little bit. But um, and we probably would have had time for like one other type of release. But um, I think that's what I'm comfortable with is skipping the summer, skipping the Christmas, and and doing some sort of major record in the fall that we can all get behind, and then a couple of cool things in the winter and spring. Mm. Well, and you, you feel like you guys are in a unique position in that way, and that you do most of the recording for the record label. Which, listening to the podcast, like I don't know that anyone out there is really doing that as well. Yeah, and I didn't. I never thought of that to be a unique thing until five, six years in. Yeah. But now it, yeah, it's totally a unique thing. Mm -hmm. And it, when I read um, Sam Phillips' biography, which is a really, really great book, yeah. it was it was enlightening because I was like, Sam and I are very similar in that mm -hmm. we have this desire for gear and this passion for recording and stuff. And then he was was making these records and then trying to sell them to these record labels. So these these guys like Elvis and Johnny and and Perkins would come in off the street and record a song. And then he would try to sell it to a record label right. and they didn't want anything to do with it. And so he ended up starting his own record label. And I just think I was reading that biography. I was like, wow, this is so cool. This is what we do mm -hmm. that I have the studio. I love to, to make music and to produce records. And then we turn around and from the same room, we package them and, and try yeah. to sell them. So it, that's one of the reasons why the release schedule is so minimal is that instead of getting these completely mastered records from strangers all over the world, um, it's something that is like talked about here in pre-production yeah. and then recorded and mixed and mastered over, over the course of two years. And then it's released. Hmm. 
and it keeps the cost down for artists. It means yeah. it's like a hundred percent profit for myself and for the the artists right off the get go. Um, but it's obviously an insanely arduous process. And the curse that I would like to one day fix is that when I get to the promotional part of it, I'm so done. Right. You know, I'm just the entrepreneurial spirit in me is thinking about the new record that I'm talking about and meeting with. Like by the time that, that my record is done and out or just about to be released, I'm already in a heavy pre-production or production stage with Illetry or, or, or Essen or a new record. Yeah. And that's where my heart is. That's where all the excitement is. So I, I fail at, at uh, doing the PR and the mm. publicity and the press on, on the records that are done just because you're always looking for something new. You know, so totally. in a way it's fun. It's a cool process. And you're right. Talking with the other labels, I didn't know anybody else, uh, unless it's like a DIY artist mm -hmm. who has their own label. Um, yeah, nobody else does that. And it's kind of interesting. Do you think that affects when you go to do PR because you've had a hand in it? In the same way that it might be awkward to promote your your own record? I, yes. Have you found that? I definitely, been... I'm more self-conscious about the albums as if it were my own. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've promoted my own singles and my own um, albums to people. And I'm like, hey, this is other songs' latest release. It's my record. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that feels really awkward. It's so awkward. Um, and I know that other people have that same feeling. So you just get over it. Um, but I also feel that a little bit too with the, hmm. you know, Tim at the Brave. It's like I produced and mixed and, and helped in that shaping that record for two years. And I, I feel self-conscious about it. And when he sings out a key or when the lyric is not 100% great, that's my sin. That, it's a that, reflection that, on it's you. It's a reflection on me and it really burns. You know? So it's like I, I kind of take on their um, their self-consciousness, you know? Um, and, and it's weird because sometimes like an M. Grigg record um, or – uh, Illetry right now is mm -hmm. something that is is being essentially recorded out of the, the Haney studio, record. or the Haney record. I can just come in and say, "I love this record. Yeah. Like there is nothing wrong with this record. It is beautiful, and I can preach it from the rooftops. I didn't tarnish it. In I any didn't way. tarnish it. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like you know, it's like psycho psychologically too. It's it. Um, yeah, I just I'm. I, it's still new to me, hmm. so I'm a fan of it. And I would say, you know, um, Matt from Forge Artifacts, I think, was the one who said, or no, it was um, Sean6131, whatever, um, said that, like, everything that they do starts of, out of a place of fandom hmm. and that everything is about being a huge fan of the artist. And, you know, at 613, when they discovered Julian Baker on Bandcamp and they were big fans of her and they, you know, promoted that record. And... It's. I find it's harder to be a fan of the music you've created, you know, because you're. It's a fun process, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say that I'm a fan of myself. You know, that I'm a fan of my music. By the yeah. time it's released, I'm. I'm. It makes me feel icky, you know, to listen hmm. to it. It's. It. So it's almost the same way with the records that I make with other artists. It's like it's done. It's for the people. Yeah. I want to move on to something that's more pure that hasn't touched the light yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally, totally. But at the same time, I feel like your releases have been amongst your more successful releases on the label. Yeah. That's awkward too. I find, yeah, <laughs> you know what but I mean? It's, yeah. it's the reality, right? And I, that's just because I had a head start. And, yeah. and the thing that I've realized talking with Sonic Onion, who's a, 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 a label that's been around for a while catalog uh, career artists are the ones who are successful it's mm -hmm. not necessarily about talent it's not about who makes a, a more cutting edge record it's about who's been doing it the longest and been building the foundation name and, recognition yeah, exactly and i i don't think that my releases are better than anybody else's and I, I know that that my playing is weaker than other people's and my songwriting might be weaker and different things but it's that I have been doing this since 2005 was my first official thing. Yeah. And I have got to know my audience and I've know where to find more audience. And I, and you know, it's even as something as modest as like, if you pick up 10 fans on every year, then like 
you're you're gonna like 10 diehard fans and like after 15 years you've now got like a pretty decent little like crew of people who are going to support everything you do and so i know like we have friends who are coming up with their debut eps and are looking for success or they're looking for big numbers and it's like no but in 10 years from now i think you're going to find it and it's just doing exactly what you're doing today Mm -hmm. but not stopping being as passionate as consistent for the next 10 years so so yeah my records i just think it's just because of um it's just having a head start Hmm. earning people's trust you know yeah well, I would fight you on that a little bit, but I'll let you have it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about the, I feel like you guys take a very digital approach. People aren't really playing out. Mm-hmm. Um, in my mind, Other Songs is the opposite of like a, a DIY tape label where guys are out on the road for 150 nights a year, yeah. sort of grinding it out. Yeah. How did you, how did you get to that as a model? Well, it is, it wasn't intentional. It was just that I prefer to be at home. I don't like live music. I've said that to, to everybody I talk to. I, yeah. real, I, as an artist, don't like playing live shows. Um, I had a lot of I PTSD from 10 years of doing <laughs> it and, and driving to, I would, um, my wife and I would drive four hours to Sarnia yeah. and to show up at this festival that I was supposed to be playing at. And I was playing at a butcher, butcher shop. And I asked the butcher, where's the stage? And he's like, there's a microphone, there's a PA system in the basement in the closet, help yourself. And and I would set up and I've, dri- I've driven four hours. I'm not getting any, I'm not getting paid at all. I have to set up my own merch table and um, and I, I'm standing just in the corner in front of somebody's table and I'm I, being obnoxious to these like people. Like annoying these people. Annoying these people. And- and I had so many like worse stories than hmm. that. Uh, and and I know every artist does. Yeah. But for me, it was like, I, I can't do this. And at the same time, in 2007, I released this, this um, DIY record called Lonesome Town, which was like half covers, half originals. And I uploaded it to the Josh Rose message board. Josh was like this like quite famous, like singer songwriter back in the early Ryan Adams, Josh Ritter era. And I uploaded it up to his message board thinking that other fans would of my, of his music would like my music. And I ended up getting like a few dozen lifelong fans from this thing. They all bought my CD from Europe and, and it, it it just like became this like, Hmm. and this was 2007 and it was, this time where I was like, wow, like selling MP3s and selling, finding, I can do go right directly to the to the fan mm-hmm. through these message boards easier than if I'm playing in a butcher shop, right? <laughs> like, what's the chances of me finding like yeah. a, a alt singer song alt folk sing, singer songwriter fan there at a butcher shop? But I'm going to go right to their message board and find them, and that was kind of an eye opening thing, it, and. And I, it just evolved. It evolved from the fact that mm. I like to be in the studio. I like to be at home with my family, with books. And, and I don't l- like the touring thing. I don't like the being cold in the venue, not getting to go on till midnight. And 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 then playing. I like playing for people. That's why we do house shows. But yeah. it's not worth all of the the stress when, when I believe that we can do something in-house that's small and modest put it up online and find a fan base the same way. And my argument is that we don't have, everyone says that live music is the way it should be. And that's the the, the big thing for artists, but we don't have the precedent um, of the internet in mm. to, to, to pull from for live music. So if we're saying that it's always been about live music, well, that's because they didn't have streaming video in the 70s. And so if if it's always been about going to clubs and to seeing a band, well, we didn't have the tools back then. So we don't we can't say that. We can't say that that's the best way to reach an right. audience. And so when I look at the internet now and being able to do like a breakdown of how I made a record on YouTube and hmm. and showing the the stems and showing the video of the tools I use, um, that might be a more intimate experience for people or doing this podcast, having this conversation. So 
I just think there's a new, like, unexplored world out there. And for people who don't like playing live, don't have the resources or have a full-time job or a family, and they're not able to tour in the way that some of those bands are, there's got to be another way. Hmm. And for other songs, the singer-songwriter... Um, you know, we were blessed with house shows where we had great listeners. But aside from that, s- singer songwriters don't do well playing clubs. They don't yeah. do well, and if you don't have a drum kit, uh, you know, like, it's just yeah, it's not it's not going to work. So, whereas Sunday morning, if you're have a cup of tea and you're reading and you put on like a folk playlist or you put on a Tim of the Brave record or James mm. Hoffman record, it fits that moment way better than a Friday night you know, at one in the morning in a club. So that, that's like my heart. That's my passion. It's not intentional. It just comes out of what I prefer as a music Mm. listener. I prefer the intimate moments on vinyl more so than in a theater or in a club. And I know I'm, I'm like the minority in the music scene, but, um, that's just me. So that's the, the label is modeled after my preferences. Hmm. I, I was wondering about that in general and how your aesthetic comes into this. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's one way. I also feel like the releases and sort of the genre, it starts out as very folk folk focused. Yeah. There's a lot of banjo. And yeah. you guys have been moving, you've been moving away from that and towards more electronic influences. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a bit about that? How your aesthetic has sort of governed your own releases, but the the label in general? Well, because 90% of the releases come out of the studio, we all use the same tools. Yeah, And so, which I think has been really cool and it, it's not been intentional. It's just been, you know, the, the acoustic guitar here that I would have used on all my records is used on um, the John Thumb record and yeah. it's used on the Tim of the Brave record. And it's just because that's what people pull from. Same with the mics and, and, and so... The folk music in the early 2000s was, it was, it was coming for me. It was because of Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash was having this resurgence with Rick Rubin. And I got really into that American recordings catalog. And that's where I got into country and folk music. Hmm. The first, my my first record won country album of the year, (laughs) (laughs) the Hamilton Music Awards. And I was like, really ashamed of that title. I was glad I won the award, but it, it, country album of the year was... Maybe not the category you Yeah, I, was, I never really thought of myself. Like I never had a, a bucket hat, uh, a cowboy a hat. A bucket hat, that'd be a different thing. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, um, but folk music was really, and it was the era of like, it was like Instagram had just gotten started or, yeah. the, or the app before that. I can't remember what it was, but it was like all of this like, vintage like toasty filters yeah yeah like these like folksy stuff and 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 then like the mumford thing came about and um and so it was just like a really folksy time and we were just kind of we actually were really lucky because i think there was a lot of us who were into dylan and johnny cash and hank williams and and willie nelson and ryan adams and whiskey town that sound and then all of a sudden it became mainstream and we got really lucky with other songs i Mm. think that was a the uh, uh, 2010 2011 was a a really lucky time for us but then it's like the banjo was something or the ukulele was something that wasn't appropriate in the early 2000s it was it was weird and so we embraced that and then at the same time if you had used a a Wurlitzer or a electronic piano or a Juno synth in the mid to early 2000s that would have been a big no-no yeah it because everything was about Hammond b3 organs real pianos everything was about organic instruments and so then as the 2000s moved on and you started using like electronic elements um it 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 became these no-nos into like okay maybe we could try some of this stuff it's kind of cool and so it's just always been that like the the term other songs is i to me i like the idea of just exploring for new sounds Hmm. and doing things that feel a little uncomfortable and and interesting um and I try to push any artist that I'm working with to to say, 
you know, let's try out some electronic elements. Let's try out some field recordings. You know, John Thumb's record is full yeah. of field recordings. And I love that, you know, that kind of thing is really cool. Um, but at the same time, it's just about like trying to find something fresh. And with this new Fanny Price track that we were releasing, it started off as a folk song. And then I used the Moog and created a Moog bass line and a drum machine. And we, it turned into this big electronic song hmm. and we worked on it for about three or four months to the point where I got really sick of the Moog sound and I muted it and re-recorded the acoustic and we added a banjo and it went back to the folk and she was a lot more happy that we went into this more like honest stripped down hmm. sound. So it's always, it's always changing. Um, and, uh, Today I was recording with the banjo again, and I, it was great to pull it out again. Yeah. I know you're a great picker, so you'll be happy that it's coming back. Totally. <laughs> That's cool. Well, and I, I wonder about that community aspect, too. You were saying that you have people in here, you're experimenting, people are, are sharing gear. And I feel like that's been at the same time that you and your aesthetic are sort of at the core of what Other Songs is. There are this group of people in the mix and on the periphery who have been involved, people like Gareth, people like mm -hmm. Glenn, who aren't, when you go to look at the catalog, their faces aren't up there. Right. But there are these people, same people come to the shows, same yeah. people buy the records. Yeah. How has that influenced what you guys have done? Well, the cool thing was when we started and it was bring everybody into the fold, yeah. it, everybody was looking for something like this hmm. and it started off less as a label and more of a collective it started as this i mean were you at the um the label party at the mulberry in 2011 no i don't think so uh, there's pictures so i've I'm, seen I the photos see. yeah, yeah okay um but it was this thing where like all of these like college students uh, because all of the artists were college students at the yeah. time um everybody came out to this thing in the hmm. in like a cold day in march and you know, packed out this cafe and, and you just got this sense that everyone was like, we all love music. We all love writing music and singing along. And it was, it was like the, the label for the past like five or 10 years has been this giant campfire hmm. and everybody just wants to sing on. I can't tell you how many times different people will text me and say, I heard you're making a record with so-and-so. I want to be on it. Like, let me know cool. what I can do on it. And it's just, there's people just want to be a part of that record. And I get that. I like when a record comes out and goes, I'm on that. You yeah. know, like, I, like yeah. that's just kind of cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's always, that's always played a part. And there, there have been people who, you know, exactly like Gareth and Glenn are huge. Your wife, Al has been yeah. on nearly every single record. I mean, probably more than anybody else. Hmm. And, and yet it doesn't ha isn't an artist on the label or or, or whatnot. Um, it's uh, yeah, I think the artist is just this name that you put on a CD because that's what you do. But it's like everything is is community based. Everybody has a chance to make a record at one point or another. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I just think I think it's a really cool thing. And I think ever, at the time everybody was hungry to be a part of something that was music related it was like um it was like a sports team but it was for music and uh, you know i got the sense that some people wanted to just come to the house shows and sit on the floor and sway some people wanted to be up on stage and sing harmony some people wanted to be the songwriter or the frontman hmm. and some people wanted to take photographs you know and and so and other people wanted to just sit there quietly and and be patrons and and buy the records for their family and friends. Everybody played like a really, and still plays like a really special role in the, in that community. Hmm. Very cool. You've talked a bit about when you've had other people on. Um, if they have a unifying vision in mind, or if, when you, is there a uh, prototypical other songs release in your mind? There was for the first five years. It was, aside from Allosaurus, which was an electronic record we yeah. did, that was more of like, I, I love that record and I love those guys. They 
they it was a, a record well ahead of its time. In fact, it's just, it's sad how ahead of that of that of its time that record was, uh, old solar. But um, because if it had come out like now or five yeah. years, three years ago, yeah. it, they would have blown up. But anyway, for the most part, it was this lo-fi acoustic indie folk sound. Hmm. The reason it was that was a I liked it. I like room noise and mistakes and gang vocals and claps. But it's also like I'm not a great engineer. I don't have the same tools that other people do, so it's easier to make totally lo-fi music. And and so I would say for five six years that was the sound, and even to a point in about 2013, 2014, 2015 when I started like taking things a little more seriously and trying to reshape the sound, I wanted to really kind of recommit to that folksy indie folk lo-fi sound but and and i and there's a lot of labels who have that aesthetic but most of the people i say when i ask that question to they say no hmm. that they don't have an aesthetic even though even though they do right they say they don't and now like since i bought the moak and i've been experimenting more in electronic we've have to we've moved away from that yeah and, and now I'm just chasing sounds that are, are original and are interesting and are um, just really minimal. Hmm. And um, and then the new records that we're working on with Illetry and with Essen are taking us to completely new areas. And I want to get into some more experimental sounds. So unfortunately, like my ear led me away from a consistent aesthetic. So I don't know if there is one Maybe other people hear it. Maybe mm. it's just a visual aesthetic. Maybe, um, you know, maybe people can hear the recording production that, that comes out of here on every record. Um, I certainly appreciate when a label has a consistent aesthetic because it's like it's like a restaurant. You go to that label for a certain type of food mm. or a certain type of music. So I appreciate that, but I know a lot of labels don't like to run that way. Or they don't like, want to own up to it at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Can you talk a bit about the visual aesthetics? I think that's a part of it as well. Yeah, and that's just the whole thing is when somebody when I was a kid and I'd get a record, a CD in high school and I the artwork was special to me even before I was a, aware of art or graphic design as a teenager if the artwork was cool, I remember pulling out the the fold out and smelling the hmm. ink and the paper and reading all the liner notes, listening to a record a CD or a record or a tape, it was a whole experience. And the music video and the band photos and the publicity articles and everything, everything, when it, when it felt cohesive for an album, um, like Kid A, I remember when Kid A came out, they did these um, listening parties in movie theaters where they just had the Radiohead logo like glitchy on the screen hmm. and they played the whole album and and Tom didn't do any press for it at all and, and everything was... It was just very Radiohead. Cool. Um, and and then the artwork was kind of mysterious and creepy. That experience has stuck with me my whole life. And hmm. so when i making a record label and making a record, I don't just want to be like, like, you know, we have friends who, who make a record and just say, I don't care what the artwork is. Like, right. I'll just use this Instagram photo or, or you know, my friend's going to do something, draw something for me. Like, to me, it's like, no, no, no. I, I want as much effort to go into the artwork as as we did with the songs. You mm. know, you wouldn't you wouldn't come up with the artwork and then just say, "Oh, I'm, I'm just going to grab a song from my friend's going to write something for me." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like do it in the reverse. Yeah, I just don't I just don't like that. I I think it's really important because mm. for me, it's the whole experience. Is now it's vinyl and and getting what color they choose for the discs and and the 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 reverse paper and everything is is such an experience. Hmm. So I like things to be really cohesive and and so that's just yeah, that's just really important to me. And I feel like that comes out of like that's part of your focus, I feel like is also the materiality of it and mm -hmm. the branding and like that comes out of your your day job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your regular life that not only is the music great, not only is the artwork great? But when you hold it there, you can tell that you put a lot of thought into this physical object. That's cool. Which I think is really neat. Yeah. 
Can you talk a little bit about, I've been thinking about record labels and uh, publishing and mm-hmm. things like that. And these really DIY sort of small time projects. And at what point does that become this thing? It starts out as like a joke among friends yeah. or something you put on the back of your CD. At what point does that cross over to become, okay, this is actually a record label now. Yeah, We're not in the era where we've got Cash and Elvis and we've got physical necessarily set aside recording studios or mm-hmm. we've got, you don't have an other song's office necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other songs is, it's the domain, right? Yeah. You bought the yeah. domain, right. it's the Instagram account, yeah. it's all these sort of immaterial things. Was there a point in your mind where it sort of switched over and you were like, okay, we we are a record label now. You felt comfortable telling people, oh, I, I run a record label. Right, yeah. Well, I still don't feel comfortable telling people I run a record <laughs> label. Like at my daughter's school, I'll, I'll just <laughs> make something else up. But um, yeah, it, I, I would say probably in the past two or three years, especially with the studio tours on YouTube mm-hmm. that we did where we went mm-hmm. out and meet, met people, engineers, and and, um, and we started meeting the people in the community through YouTube. And then with the podcast, um, I mean, launching the podcast was this thing where I wanted to figure out how these other labels did it hmm. because I admired them and respected them and I saw them as more successful, more legitimate than than myself. Yeah. And I I want to know how, I want to know why. And uh, so so yeah, I mean I now I do feel like I do feel like there's a little bit more um focus on what I do. I think when you it's easy to to not take yourself seriously because if you hold yourself up against another example of a record label, Mm. because if you don't have the same sales or the same people following you on Twitter or the, or the same artists on your roster, then, then you're, you consider yourself a failure. It's, it's plain and simple. I look at, um, you know, captured tracks has been around for 10 years and they're, and they're massive and they have the, the, some of the most respected indie labels, indie, um, artists, in the world. And so up against them, I'm a, I'm a nobody. I'm, yeah. And, but that's wrong. You know, that's, it's, it's wrong to do that. This label has formed out of who I am and the stuff that I'm interested in. And it's not been touring. It's not been, you know, having the bands work their way up to play on Conan. It's, it's not even been about physical distribution. Yeah. It's, it's been about, the online presence. It's been about the songs, about trying to, to playlist the songs. It's been about the community and the impact we've had on people here in Hamilton yeah. and the, the amount of relationships that have formed and babies that have been born and all out of this label. And um, that, that it, we've been doing our own thing since mm-hmm. the beginning. And so I feel like in the last like two or three years, since we've done more of this outward facing initiatives that I am starting to come to peace more with, this is who we are. This is what success looks like. Um, And you start to see it too. You start to see that like, okay, an album that releases gets just a little bit more traction. You get just a little bit more um, opportunities that come from third parties that want to work with you. And, um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm not really sure like when, when it exactly it happened, moment. but definitely in the past three or three or two or three years, I've no longer will allow myself to, to not take it seriously. Mm-hmm. And I think that I try to remind myself when you're starting a business or you're starting it, you can't, it's only going to grow as hard as you, as you work for it. Like if I want this to be my nine to five, like my 40 hour a week job, why aren't, why aren't I working 40 hours a week? You know, that like dress for the job you want. It's like, well, you've got to work for the company that you want. You have to like put in the time before it, it pays you back. You know what I mean? And I know a lot of people disagree with that. A lot of people would, would say, well, that you're burning yourself out but it's worth it for me. It's worth mm-hmm. it to have a family, to work a real job, and then to put in an extra 40 hours a week. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to get there. And I think that the label was growing super slow because I was doing 10 hours a week on the side 
and I wasn't selling myself out for it. And the labels that I look at who are successful, quote unquote, are, are the ones who have actually put their money where their mouth is. And they've, they've pressed vinyl on their own personal credit cards. Hmm. They've taken a huge risk in investing in bands with, without the promise of getting any money back. And, and the labels that I've talked to, I would say 90% of them have done that, have put tape pressings and vinyl pressings on their own credit cards, are in bad debt, have bad credit. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I respect them for that because they've really said, I want to do this. And, um, and so I was a little bit more risk adverse. Yeah. Um, but now I try, to, I try to take a few more risks, I think. Mm. And I was surprised by that as well, listening to the other podcasts. But I feel like what you're describing is maybe even more of a business focus too, like treating it like any other mm -hmm. startup or yeah. like entrepreneurship project. Yeah. Has that been a, a shift for you? Definitely. And that was the thing is right from the beginning, it was an art project. It was a, mm -hmm. it was a vanity project. If anything, it was like, we have a record label that yeah. back then there weren't as many independent record labels. And so to say we have a record label and we were legitimate because we had a roster and we had a logo and it was, that was enough for us. It was just mm -hmm. a really cool thing. I felt legitimate and the name was growing over our, in our community and in, in, in the, the country. Mm -hmm. And people had heard about us. People had were checking out one artist because they had liked the other one. So to me, that was it. That was like, that's what we've aimed for. What else are we going to expect? I didn't, I never thought, what if we pressed a thousand vinyl of a, a new release and we, and we tried to get distribution across Canada and we tried to get them on a tour. Mm -hmm. Who's the right people to talk to for that? I never thought that because I was too intimidated by it. And I kept telling myself, we're not that kind of label. We're just, we're just doing this for fun. I don't want to take my wife's money and and put that into a vinyl yeah. pressing, um, and and I do think that that was I do still think that was like a a decent decision, but I understand how that maybe held us back, hmm. um, and so when you think of it more as this is a business, and you know when people start a studio and they buy tons of gear right off the get go, um, or if you were to start a a coffee shop you have to buy a cappuccino machine. And I imagine those are really expensive. I mean, they've got to be like 10 grand, like <laughs> yeah. those beautiful cappuccino machines. You can't just do it like risk adverse and say, I'm just going to do instant coffee, yeah. you know? Yeah. So if you're just, you you got to get a lease, you got to sign up for one year and you got to get a $10,000 cappuccino machine at least. Well, when you're starting a label, we didn't do that. We, mm. we didn't get a lease. We never had a building. We didn't pay anybody to make a logo for us. It was just two letters at the time. It was like, we didn't do any of that. And so we were kind of coaxing around like everything was profit, but we weren't really growing that fast because mm. we weren't taking any risks. Are you moving, are you hoping to move towards a place where this is full time, this is a real business, a real record label? Yeah, absolutely. And I've been really encouraged to, to look at some really big successful labels in the States um, where the owner has not yet gone full time, hmm. you know, and not encouraged, you know, uh, encouraged is the right word because yeah. in relieved too, you know, yeah. to be like, yeah. oh, okay, I, I thought it was just me who sucked, you know, hmm. um, and it's not that anybody sucks, it's just that it's hard, <laughs> totally. it's really hard to make a living off a of band camp. And so, um, yeah, I definitely feel that's the goal. And the only way to do it, and I think a lot of labels would agree, is to diversify. I mean, if you are trying to um, be to have full time employees on Bandcamp alone, it, it couldn't it couldn't be done. If you're trying to do it on Spotify and Spotify playlist hmm. alone, it couldn't be done. But with the studio, I have the ability to do podcasts. I have the ability to mix other people's records and master other people's records and um, we have the ability to, um, because we record the the whole record, we can strip it back to the stems and and repurpose the masters for licensing hmm. things. And so we can take what is kind of a quirky indie rock song and sharpen it up a little bit and polish it up and make it for a quirky indie movie or something. And so we have we have those ways of like, and for me, yeah, obviously I love to come in here. And, and light a candle and write 
a weird, sad folk song yeah. and have the bank deposit a thousand dollars for that hard day's work. Like I would, I would love whatever universe that is. And maybe in a, in a hundred years, that's the case. Like for our grandkids, like, you know, they'll, they'll uh, being a, uh, a guitar player is the same as being a doctor. I don't know, but, <laughs> but you know, that's not the case so that it has to be, um, but I still want to be up here in the attic doing music things. Some days that's writing a jingle. Some days that's interviewing somebody uh, or mixing another record, hmm. um, but or or writing my own music. It's just expanded a little bit. Yeah, and I and I just but I like that. I like that diversity. It's super fun. Well, and then you can you get a chance to have your hands in a bunch of different things mm-hmm. too. So that's where you're going business wise. Where uh, where are things going artistically? What do you guys have planned for the near future, the next ten years? Well, um, I think the next ten years it would be just the same as what it is for this year, which is just to continue to make records and to continue to see that that end of year number grow just a little bit, <clears throat> and um, to get more people aware of of the album and. Uh, the albums we do and and the records we do and it's all of these little things like the studio series and and you know um interacting with people on youtube with with little videos and and doing the podcast um i love doing the podcast i love meeting people um i probably should sit down a little bit more and say how are we going to do this Hmm. what are the songs that do do better what are the artists that do better how can we do more of that um, I, I maybe should do that, but I think it's just keep doing what you're doing. Don't get too distracted on what's successful and what's not. Just always continue to make records from your heart and that you think are cool. And uh, there's been an audience for that. And then I think that audience will get bigger and hmm. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think you're right. And I want to, as much as you might be reticent to talk about your own success or even you're talking about feeling weird about sitting down to do this and to yeah, talk about yeah, your yeah. own label. I think that Other Songs is a project that has been really meaningful for a lot of people, like right. you said. And I'm sure you get glimpses of that yeah, when people yeah. come and say, this is what this album has meant for me. But even beyond the songs, the the experience of community that we were talking about mm-hmm. and how that yeah, I mean, for for our group of friends, that has really galvanized a bunch of people. And that's true, and that's the stuff that's hard to. It's so intangible. <laughs> it's so it's intangible. It's not on the spreadsheet. It's not on the spreadsheet. Yeah, you're right, though. But I mean, the relationships that are so old now that you forget their origins. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I talked about Piro and this. We did this one Thanksgiving Saturday weekend in 2009, where we in opened up my living room, hmm. moved out all the furniture, and we recorded their record on Thanksgiving weekend. And I remember this guy coming over, this is 2009, this guy coming over in this plaid shirt with this with tall guy with good hair. And it was Tim of Tim and the Brave. Yeah. And he was just standing around in the way, and I didn't know who he was, <laughs> much like he is now. Yeah. Uh, but just standing around drinking a beer and just kind of being like, oh, this is cool. And, and you know, and now like, that was that was like what I don't know. That was two thousand nine. It was ten years ago yeah. that that happened, and and now we're the best of friends, and and he is part of this integral part of this community, hmm. <clears throat> and so many people were in and out during that session and other sessions, and and the way that I met other people through those things, it the community aspect of it. Even though I don't like to leave my house and I don't like to play live, um, you can't do something like this if you yeah. don't get out and meet people. And you know we interviewed uh, David Sachs of the Revenge of Analog, yep. and that was my takeaway from that podcast was was the the real life matters is that like the the tangible relationships that you have with people um, it will it will beat any Instagram post or hmm. any Instagram like by a thousand times you know and um, so you're right I mean the the label has had an impact. And um, there has been like that power in numbers. It's just hard to totally. 
to that own doesn't that show up on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think it has been a, a yeah. big success. So yeah. Congrats. Oh, thank you. And thank you for listening. It's been an incredible year. This has been probably the most exciting project I've got to work on um, in music in quite some time. And it's been such a blessing to have people listen, to have people respond, to have labels say yes. My goodness, that was the biggest fear right from the beginning. I, I had the idea in the fall of, of 2016 and I, I, or 2017, and I started emailing some people just before Christmas and nobody responded in the first like couple of days. And I was like, yeah, maybe this is a terrible idea. And then slowly they started responding and then over the next... Uh, year it's just been such a great time to chat with these people and and quite frankly there's people i'm chatting with that i have no business speaking to so thank you for that and thank you to our listeners after getting a chance to listen back to this interview with ben i realized that had this podcast been recorded a few weeks later i probably would have used less ryan adams references but what can you do Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Please continue to tell your friends about this and share it wherever you can for people you think would be interested in record labels. And also, listen, support record labels. Um, I had I, I was just recently um, really touched by this like ambient drone record, and I, and I went to to the website where they sold vinyl, and um, I added it to my cart, and then I realized that the the shipping was a lot and then from euro to canadian dollars was a lot and i just thought you know what i'm gonna bite the bullet because um somebody bought a record from us and from germany and the shipping was insane and the conversion rate was probably insane for them um, but they did it they bit the bullet and so i used that money that they sent me to buy a record and so consider supporting record labels um, even if you run a record label um, cause it's a good thing to do.